Once again, I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank God because of you and how you're faring with your studies. Personally, I'm much fine. The Lord has kept me and I keep on pressing on by God's grace. So we are ready to begin our class this wonderful time. And I want us just to begin by a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, we bless you. All the praises, all the honor, your name is lifted up far above the firmaments. You are awesome, robed in majesty, and you are God and God alone. You never partake of your glory with anyone. I pray for every student that, Lord, you may bless it and everyone keep us safe in your arms wherever we are, in every continent, in every country, in every community, Lord, that all the praises may be back to you. Thank you for our students, Lord, keep them safe. And uh, Lord, those who are sick, please, we are asking that you may heal them, give them health. According to your word in Psalms 107 verse 20, you sent forth your word and your word healed us. May your word heal us, our sicknesses, our infirmities, our failures, and our bodies, O God of heaven. Thank you and we bless you. Bless our class today in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord strengthen you and grace you by his grace and mercies that you may keep on uh, serving him in whichever area he has called you. So we want to continue with our class, which is Old Testament Survey. This is Old Testament survey. Old Testament survey. And uh, we did class four, so this should be class five. In short, you can call this one OTS, Old Testament Survey. Uh, we did the book or the summary of the book of Ruth in class four. So we want to start with a summary of the book of uh, First Samuel. This is summary, summary of the book. The book of First Samuel. Okay, summary of the book of First Samuel. Uh, I want to begin by the author. And the author of this book is uh, anonymous. But we know that Samuel wrote a book. From the scriptures, it's evident that Samuel wrote a book. And uh, that is uh, clear in First Samuel chapter 10 and verse 25. And it is very possible that the, uh, he wrote part of this book as well. Yes, so the book that was written by prophet Samuel uh, it is evident in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 25, and uh, it is the same book that uh, suggests that he wrote this book of Samuel, and other possible contributors to 1 Samuel are the prophets or historians like Nathan and also God. So we can say it's a combination of uh, Samuel, the prophet, and also possible author also is Nathan and we are also having God. Those are the possible writers which is uh, uh, clear in First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 29 you will be able to see it there and also First Samuel 10 25. The book of 1 Samuel, 
chapter 10 and verse 25, you will also see, it is very evident there, something else to note is the date of writing. The date of writing this book, originally the book of First and Second Samuel were one book. Yes, so before it was one book, before it was separated from First Samuel and Second Samuel, it was just one book. And we can see that um, uh, the translators of the Septuagint separated them, and we have retained that separation ever since. The events of First Samuel span approximately a hundred years, and so from a hundred, eleven hundred, eleven hundred. BC, BC up to 11, 1000 BC, 1000 BC. Those are the probable dates that the book of Samuel was written. And we can see that uh, the events of 2 Samuel cut another, another 40 years. The event of 2 Samuel covers another 40 years. So the date of writing then would be sometimes after 960 BC. Uh, 960 BC. 960 BC. So we can see that first, first Samuel, Samuel, and also up to second Samuel. A total, the, a total of 140 years, and therefore it was one book as we have seen. That's why it's counted from the first to the second, because it was one. So the purpose for writing this book is that first Samuel records the history of Israel. Let's say the purpose, purpose of writing. Samuel records, Samuel records the events. Samuel is recording the events. Events and history, events and history of Israel, of Israel. That was the purpose. And this history of Israel right in the land of Canaan, as they move from the rule of judges and to being a unified nation under kings. We said before that uh, the Israelites was ruled by judges, and then from judges it went to kings, and so Samuel emerges as the last judge. Samuel emerges as the last judge, and the, he anoints the first two kings, Saul and David. Uh, we can see that uh, Samuel was the last judge. He was the last judge, and he anointed two kings. Anointed two kings. Who are these kings? This is David, King David, and also Saul. Actually, Saul was the first. Saul, then King David. Those are the two kings that Samuel, as the last judge of Israel, anointed. Let's look at the key verses of this book. Key verses. When we talk of the key verses, we are meaning that uh, the verse that uh, is very instrumental or covers the main and major theme in a book. But when they said, Give us a king, uh, we are talking about 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 6 to 7 it says but when they said give us a king to lead us 
This displeased Samuel, so he went, prayed to the Lord. He went, prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Okay? The people demanded a king. And in actual sense, the, it was one way of rejecting God as their sole king, the only king that was leading them and was their leader. So they asked for the earthly king. Their motives were wrong, but God allowed it. Why? So that they can learn from their mistakes. But God could not just allow them instantly. God had to prepare them so that whenever they are making a decision, they can be well informed and also the repercussions that were to follow them and to follow their decisions. You acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. That's another key verse. And it is in First Samuel chapter 13 verse 13 up to 14. Uh, God was not happy with King Saul simply because he acted foolishly and his kingdom could not continue because he disobeyed the Lord. And also another key verse here is 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15 in verses 22 to 23. It says, But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Those were the very harsh words of Samuel the prophet to King Saul because God had told Saul to destroy all the enemies but Saul decided to spare the king and some of the fatlings of the rams which he brought with them. And this was contrary to the word of God. And so Samuel was very bitter. And we can see that Samuel the prophet decided to take the sword and finish that king who was called Agag. And uh, that was the end of him. But that thing really displeased the Lord and it was a big issue altogether. And the question was very plain. Does God delight in offerings? Obedience is better than sacrifice. That's a very trending uh, narrative among us Christians even today. And so every time we remember the story of Saul, how God loved him, God chose him, but eventually ended up disappointing God. This shows that many times we fail and many times we wander from the ways and the word of God. But coming back to God and making a rebound is very key and should be very key because it will really help us even to reconcile with God. The problem with Saul is that he never repented, he never went back to God, he never 
uh, admitted his mistakes, but rather he went even to seek some foreign gods which really displeased the Lord, the God of Israel. And this is ever true that even today, most of us, we are not repentant. We don't see the mistakes we commit and therefore we end up failing and being against the word of God. Let's look at the brief summary of this book. Brief summary. Brief summary, okay. The book of First Samuel can be neatly divided into two sections. Into two, two sections. Two sections. Which is the life of Samuel. One is life of Samuel. Life of Samuel. And part two, that is first, uh, the life of Samuel is from chapter 1 to chapter 12. Chapter 1 to chapter 12. You will see the life of Samuel, how he used to uh, live and sleep in the temple, and how God called him. And uh, there was uh, the man of God by the name Eli, who was there. And we can see that uh, he really mentored Samuel the prophet. And we know that um, uh, Samuel was a son to Hannah who really trusted God. And God gave her a child. And she brought the child into the temple and the child dwelt there. And when God was calling him, he never knew the voice of God until he was taught and he became a prophet. And so his life is there. And also part two of this book is the life of Saul. Number two is life of Saul, who was the first king of Israel. And this is chapter 13 to 31. Chapter 13 to chapter 31. The book starts with the miraculous birth of Samuel in answer to his mother's earnest prayer. As a child, Samuel lived and served in the temple. God singled him out as a prophet in 1 Samuel 3 verse 19. And the child's first prophecy was one of judgment on the corrupt priests, okay? The Israelites go to war with their perennial enemies. Year after another, the same enemies, the Philistines, and the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant and are in temporary possession of it. But when the Lord sends judgment, the Philistines return the Ark. Samuel calls Israel to repentance in chapter 7, verse 3 to 6, and then to victory over the Philistines. The people of Israel, wait, wanting to be like other nations, desire a king. Samuel is displeased by their demands, but the Lord tells him that it is not Samuel's leadership they are rejecting, but the leadership of God himself. So Samuel was like worried, why are these people demanding for a king other than depending and relying on the God of the universe the creator of heavens and the earth, who is most powerful than any other king in this world. But after warning the people of what having a king would mean, Samuel anoints Benjamite named Saul, who is crowned in Mizpah. That one you find in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 17. And also Saul enjoys initial success, defeating the Ammonites in battle in chapter 11, but then he makes a series of missteps. He presumptuously offers a sacrifice in chapter 13, which was against the Lord. He makes a foolish vow at the expense of his son, Jonathan, and that is chapter 14. 
and he disobeys the Lord's direct command in chapter 15. As a result of Saul's rebellion, God chooses another person to take the place of Saul. Meanwhile, God removes his blessings from Saul and an evil spirit begins uh, guarding Saul toward madness in chapter 16, verse 14. It's very clear that every time that you, God is not with you, then Satan is with you. God and the Spirit of God left Saul and evil spirit took charge because the house cannot remain vacant. So after God leaving, demons are possessed. And that's why God cannot live in the same house with the demons. It's either God or Satan. So what happens is that uh, the evil spirits tormented Saul unto madness. He was just speaking by himself and he could not manage because it's not by his power nor our power every time, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Samuel travels to Bethlehem to anoint a youth named David as the next king. Chapter 16. Later David has his famous confrontation with Goliath, the Philistine, and becomes a national hero. Chapter 17. David serves in Saul's court, marries Saul's daughter, and is befriended by Saul's son. Saul himself grows jealous of David's success and popularity. Okay, that is uh, very common even today. When God is raising you up, there must be a jealous person somewhere who was feeling like it could be him, it could be her, and this is the spirit from hell. This is not the spirit of God. When God is blessing you, they feel they should have been the one being blessed. Never to remember that God has a plan and a purpose for each and every individual under the sun. Uh, we can see that, uh, and he attempts to kill David. David flees and so begins an extraordinary period of adventure intrigue you and romance. With supernatural aid, David narrowly but consistently eludes the bloodthirsty soul in chapter 19 to chapter 26. Through it all, David maintains his integrity and his friendship with Jonathan. I want to uh, shed light in some word that has been spoken there that David maintained his integrity. That's very, very key. David maintained his integrity. No matter what we go through, no matter the circumstance and situations, don't compromise your integrity. Maintain your integrity. Maintain your values in God. Maintain your relationship with God and allow God to reign in your life even more right in the midst of tribulations and circumstances that are trying to weigh you down. Knowing very well that the aim of these things that are overwhelming, uh, they are to take you out of the will of God so that you can lose your integrity and your position in Christ. Okay? And so, <sighs> Near the end of the book, Samuel has died and Saul is a lost man on the eve of a battle with Philistia. Saul seeks for answers. Having rejected God, he finds no help from heaven and he seeks counsel from a medium instead. That's what most people do. When God is not with them, then they go for other gods. But remember, the only way to make God happy about you is not that we are angels, we can't fail in one way or the other, but repentance is very key. Make a rebound, bounce back to God every time you find yourself on the wrong way, every time you find yourself to have behaved foolishly and stupid in any way, then bounce back to God, allow God 
to have his way in you. This is why the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because David uh, bounced back to God many times. He failed, he sinned, but he remembered God and uh, bounced back to God. So the difference between Saul and Paul, uh, Saul and uh, David, sorry, is because David could bounce back to God, but Saul didn't. Saul was going further and further and further from God. And uh, let's proceed from there. Saul will die in a battle the next day. The prophecy is fulfilled. Saul's three sons, including Jonathan, fall in battle and Saul commits suicide. Now it's a remorseful state that uh, after rejecting God, the sense of emptiness uh, overtakes him and he decides to commit suicide. That's how he died. And three of his sons, including Jonathan, they perished and fell right when the battle was too severe. And so there is assurance that every time God is on your side, you will always win, no matter how fierce the battle may be. But every time God is not with you, you will lose however shallow the enemy might be or uh, even however small your enemy might be, you will always fall before them. Okay, not that one. Let's look at foreshadowings. Foreshadowings. Uh, the prayer of Hannah in First Samuel chapter 2 verse 1. The prayer of Hannah in First Samuel chapter 2 verse 1 to 10 makes several prophetic references to Christ. She extols God as her rock in verse 2. And we know from the gospel accounts that Jesus is the rock. Okay, so this one is typing Jesus Christ. And also, and Jesus Christ is the rock upon whom we should build our spiritual houses. Paul refers to Jesus as the rock of offense to the Jews in Romans chapter 9 and verse 33. Romans chapter 9 and verse 33. Christ is called the spiritual rock who provided spiritual drink to the Israelites in the wilderness just as he provides living water to our souls today in 1st Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 1st Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 and also in John chapter 4 verse 10 John chapter 4 verse 10 when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman he said to her that whoever drinks from the water I give uh, the water of life shall never thirst okay so this was a sure uh, word was which was worth noting. Hannah's prayer also makes reference to the Lord who will judge the ends of the earth in verse 2 in chapter 2 verse 10 the same book of 1st Samuel while Matthew 25 verse 31 Matthew 25 31 refers to Jesus as the son of man who will come in glory to judge everyone. So we can see that this books, uh, this first Samuel speaks about uh, Jesus Christ and there are so those two stories, major ones, that are typing Jesus Christ and it's called foreshadowing. Uh, let's move to something called practical application. Practical application. The tragic story of Saul is a study in wasted opportunity. Here was a man who had it all, honor, authority, riches, good looks, and more. Yet he died in despair, terrified of his enemies, and knowing he had failed his nation his family, and his God. 
Saul made the mistake of thinking he could please God through disobedience. He thought that God is pleased in disobedience, but he was proven otherwise. Like many today, he believed that a sensible motive will compensate for bad behavior. Perhaps his power went to his head and he began to think he was above the rules, like most preachers today. Uh, God lifts you up, God blesses you, and you begin to feel like uh, you are above the rules, you are above the law of God, you are above God's word, and that God will just understand you. God is not a respecter of persons, remember that. The wasted opportunity in the life of Saul reminds us that we are not better off than Saul, but we have no choice. Our sole obligation is to serve the purpose of him who has called us. And I, I love this man so much who was called Solomon. He ended up saying that, and above all, the conclusion of the matter is that fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man, okay? So we can see that uh, even when confronted with his wrongdoing, he attempted to vindicate himself and that's when God rejected him. In chapter 15, verse 16, Saul's problem is one we all face, a problem of the heart. Obedience to God's will is necessary for success. If you wanna succeed, this word, obey God, very simple. If you want to prosper, obey God. How do you obey God? Obey his word. What he says, do. Where he leads, go. When he says no, don't, okay? And we can see that, uh, and if we in pride rebel against him, we set ourselves up for loss. Most men of God and great men have fallen just because of disobedience. David, on the other hand, did not seem like much at first. Even Samuel was tempted to overlook him in chapter 16 when he went to anoint him. But God sees the heart and saw in David a man after his own heart. In chapter 13, the humility and integrity of David coupled with his boldness for the Lord and his commitment to prayer, set a good example for us all, okay? Humility and obedience of David to God's word sets an example to be emulated by all, even today. Many generations have passed, yet this can never pass away. They must come to pass. And this is what the Lord is speaking to us. When we apply practically this book of First Samuel, let us remember how Samuel, uh, uh, how God used David and he rejected Saul. None is too big to be rejected by God. Anytime you disobey his word, then he rejects you, no matter how famous you are, no matter how great and big you are, great men like uh, King Nebuchadnezzar the, with the greatest empire on earth, Babylon, then it just fell and nothing is there to stand before God. So let's move to the summary of the book of Second Samuel. 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 And we begin with the author. 
and we can see the book of first Samuel, second Samuel does not identify its author. It could not be the prophet Samuel since he died in first Samuel. Possible writers include Nathan and Gad, and I had already said before, here in second Samuel, Samuel didn't participated in writing, but in the first Samuel he participated because he was still alive, okay? So, a uh, possible writer, a uh, prophet, Nathan, and also God. And this is evidence in First uh, Chronicles, chapter 29 and verse 29. The date of writing, date, date of writing, we are talking originally the books of First and Second Samuel were one book, I had already said. The translators of the Septuagint separated them and we have retained that separation over since. The events of First Samuel span approximately 100 years uh, from uh, 1100 BC to 1000 BC. The events of Second Samuel over another 40 years and the date of writing then would be sometimes about 960 BC. I had already explained there. And uh, we move on to purpose of writing. Purpose of writing this book. Second Samuel records. It records. the King David's reign. King David's reign. King David's reign. This book places the Davidic covenant in his its historical context. This book places the Davidic covenant in its historical context. And also key verses in this book, key verses. Uh, uh, Second Samuel, Second Samuel, chapter seven, verse 16, which says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And also another key verse is second, Samuel, uh, and uh, that should be chapter 19, verse 16, uh, verse 4, sorry. Uh, God was speaking to David in this uh, second Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, when he said that uh, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me, your throne will be established forever. That was David, he was establishing uh, what is called the Davidic Covenant. He was covenanting David. And also in Second Samuel 19, verse 4, But the king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, O oh, my son, Absalom. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Okay. Then that was the time that uh, the, his son Absalom died and it really pained David. He really wept and he grieved bitterly. And the Lord is my rock. This is Second Samuel 22. Second Samuel 22 and verse two. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge and my savior. From violent men you save me. I call to the Lord who is worth of praise and I am saved from my enemies. This was David being grateful to God for protection, for victory, for everything that God has done for him. A brief summary of this book. Brief summary. 
a brief summary of this book. The book of 2 Samuel can be divided into two sections again. Two sections. It is divided into two sections. In section one, we can talk of David triumphs. David triumphs. How he conquered battles. And uh, that is chapter one to chapter ten. And David's troubles, number two, David's troubles. Troubles. Okay. Uh, challenges must come in life. In chapter 11 to chapter 20, the last part of the book, which is chapter 21 to 24, is a non-chronological appendix which contains further details of David's reign, okay? The last part of the book, chapter 21 to 24, is a non-chronological appendix which contains further details of David's reign. The book begins with David's receiving news, okay? The book begins with David receiving news of the death of Saul and his sons. He proclaims a time of mourning. Soon afterward, David is crowned king over Judah. While Ishbosheth, one of Saul's surviving son, is crowned king over Israel in chapter 2 of the same book, a civil war follows, but Ishbosheth is murdered and the Israelites asked David to reign over them as well, okay? David moves the country's capital from Hebron to Jerusalem and later moves the Ark of the Covenant. That's in chapters five to chapter six. David's plan to build a temple in Jerusalem is vetoed by God, who then promises David the following things. One. God promised him the following things. This is number one. David would have a son to rule after him. That was a great promise. And number two, David's son would build the temple. So it was not David to build the temple because his hand was full of blood. He was a bloody king who was fighting wars and battles and he killed so many people. So God promised that his son will uh, reign someday and will build a temple. And number three, the throne occupied by David's lineage would be established forever, would be established forever. That was another promise. So every time you are talking about the Davidic covenant, you can mention this. David would have a son to rule after him. That was an assurance. David's son would build the temple. An assurance throne occupied by David lineage will be established forever. So it was an endless reign even after him. And number four, God will never take his mercy from David's house. In 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 4 up to verse 16. David leads Israel to victory over many of the enemy nations which surrounded them. He also shows kindness to the family of Jonathan by taking in Mephibosheth, Jonathan's crippled son, in 2 Samuel chapter 8 down there. Then David falls. He lasts for a beautiful woman named Bathsheba, commits adultery with her, and then has her husband murdered in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. When Nathan the prophet confronts David with his sin, David confesses and God graciously forgives. That's very key, forgiveness. Every time we repent before God, the Bible says that he is faithful to forgive us and to forget our sins. Unlike Saul, who never repented, David was a repentant king and God could forgive him. However, the Lord tells David that trouble would arise from within his own house. 
Later trouble does come when David's firstborn son Amnon rapes his half-sister Tamar in retaliation. Tamar's brother Absalom kills Amnon. Absalom then flees to Jerusalem rather than face his father's anger. Again, now we can see that uh, Absalom is uh, uh, having the spirit of unrepentance like most people are. When they have done a mistake, instead of facing the situation, repenting of their sins to God, they start running away from church and they go to another church which they are welcomed because they don't, uh, those people don't know them, their character, their behavior. And so they move from church to another, hip hopping from place to another, trying to hide their sins. But I want to say this, every time uh, you run away with sin in you, it will follow you up wherever you go. So. People may not know what you are doing or what you've done, but remember your sins will find you out. Your sins will get you from your hiding, just like a snake is gotten out by the smell of a rubber. So don't hide sin in you, it will kill you, because the wages of sin is death. Speak it out, cry it out to God, and God will remember you, God will forgive you. But every time you jump from church to another, simply because you've done worst things there, maybe you've impregnated some sisters in church, maybe you are a sister and your character is unbecoming, and whenever you are rebuked, then you run away. You join another church where they don't know you. There again, your sins will find you out. So we can learn from today and from these points how to repent before God. And so we can see that uh, later Absalom leads a revolt against David and some of David's former associates joined the rebellion in chapters 15 to 16. David is forced out of Jerusalem and Absalom sets himself as a king for a short time. The Asapa is overthrown, however, and again as David's wishes is killed, David mourns his fallen son. Once again, every time you usurp authority, you take it by force, without being given by God himself, you will definitely lose. Some brothers, some pastors, some preachers, some ministers of the gospel have done the same. They have usurped the authority of their pastor or mentor or spiritual father and they have gone to do their own things. I want to assure you by the word of God, you'd rather repent now, otherwise it will catch up with you. Your sins will follow you even to your grave. Look at Absalom, he ended up dying contrary to the will of the father David, simply because he was not repentant. He went on and on and on and on until his sin had to catch up with him and he was killed, buried and forgotten in sin, okay? And so David is forced out of Jerusalem and is mourning the death of his son. A general feeling of unrest plagues the remainder of David's reign. The men of Israel threatened to split from Judah again and David must suppress another uprising in chapter 20. The book's appendix includes informing concerning a three-year famine in the land, which is seen in chapter 21, a song of David in chapter 22, a record of the exploits of David's bravest warriors in chapter 23, and David's sinful census and the ensuing plague in chapter 24. Now, let me talk of our shadowings. The Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is seen primarily in two parts of 2 Samuel, and first, the Davidic covenant is outlined in 2 uh, Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. That's the Davidic covenant, as I had mentioned before, is seen in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, 
which says, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever and reiterated in, uh, we can see in Luke chapter 1, verse 31. Luke chapter 1, verse 31. In the words of the angel who appeared to Mary to announce Jesus' birth to her, said, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Again, we can see it was foreshadowing Jesus Christ when God said, the throne of David and this kingdom shall reign forever. Now Jesus Christ is born, and the angel confirmed the same to the mother Mary, that uh, this son, his kingdom will have no end. Christ is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. He is the son of God in the line of David who will reign forever. Second, Jesus is seen in the song of David at the end of his life. In 2 Samuel chapter 2, 22, chapter 22, verse 2, Yes, up to 51. He, say, he sings of his rock, fortress, and deliverer, his refuge and savior. Jesus is our rock, of course. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says so. And also 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 to 9. The deliverer of Israel in Romans 11, 25. The fortress to whom we have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us in Hebrews 6 verse 18 and our only savior in Luke chapter 2 verse 11 and 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. The practical application, let's look at the practical application of this book, okay? Anyone can fall, of course, I said it before, even a man like David, who truly desired to follow God, no one is uh, perfect, and we are human. David desired to follow God, and he fell, richly blessed by God. God blessed him because he repented, was susceptible to temptation. David's sin with Bathsheba should be a warning to all of us, to guard our hearts, our eyes, and our minds at the same time. Pride over our spiritual maturity and our ability to withstand temptation in our own strength is the first step to a downfall. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. There are preachers who boast that I am mature and uh, I can do it. Uh, I'm above temptations. I can overcome. No. We rely on God, that God's power and strength may help us, enable us, so that we are able to overcome temptations when they come. God is gracious to forgive even the most heinous sins when we truly repent, okay? When we truly repent, God is faithful. However, healing the wound caused by sin does not always erase the scar. Notice that one sins as natural consequences, and even after he was forgiven, David reaped what he had sown. His son from the illicit union with another man's wife was taken from him. Second Samuel chapter 12. Now David thought that uh, by him repenting, then the child will live, but we can see that the child died and uh, he stopped fasting. He said, why should I keep on fasting? Yet the child is already dead. And uh, that was the consequence he had to face for his mistake. And we can see that, uh, and David suffered the misery of a break in his loving relationship with his heavenly father in Psalms 32 and Psalms 51. How much better to avoid sin in the first place rather than having to seek forgiveness later, okay? So uh, it's good to learn of all these things so that you are not caught unaware, okay? That brings us to the end of the 
of summary of the book of second uh, the book of second Samuel. We want to move very fast to summary of the book of first Kings now. Summary of the book of First Kings. Book of First Kings. Summary of the book of First Kings. Okay. Uh, because of our time, we may not be able to do the summary of the first kings right now, but we can have some break and we shall continue after the break. And that will be our uh, sixth class because uh, class five ends there with the book of uh, second Samuel. Now, after the break, we shall continue with our sixth class about the summary of the book of First Kings. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, bless you, all the glory, honor, and praise we give to you. Thank you for our class, thank you for every student, thank you for the moment, bless us all together. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you so much. May God bless you as we meet in the next class. Thank you.